Okay, good afternoon. Um, so thank you for uh, joining this final session uh, on ADAS uh, and autonomous driving. I think most people know uh, TomTom from their role in bringing navigation to the mass market. Um, That's quite some time ago, and over time we've now moved forward, uh, and a lot of our work, a lot of our effort now sits in the autonomous driving space. And I think it's fair to say that in the coming years, we're going to see more changes than we've ever seen before in, in the automotive industry. Suddenly, there is going to be no driver in the future. Uh, that is a huge change. It's probably the biggest change from when we took the horse away uh, and put an engine in. But how is it going to change? Um, we've all seen science fiction shows showing how uh, cars will evolve. And if we think back to my childhood, uh, I remember seeing things that I couldn't believe we were ever going to see and were ever going to happen. But they're happening, and we do see them now. But how is this going to change, and who's going to lead this? Is it going to be the traditional uh, OEMs that we see? We heard from Nissan earlier. Is it going to be Nissans? Is it going to be the BMWs of this world? Or is it going to be the new arrivals, the Teslas, etc.? Or could it even be non-automotive brands? Could it be the Microsofts, the Ubers, and the Googles of this world who are going to lead this revolution? So there are three main pillars uh, in autonomous driving. Um, we have mapping, sensing, and driving policy. Mapping is the focus of TomTom, and that's what I'm going to walk through uh, in the coming slides. Within mapping, there, is, there are different areas, but the three key areas uh, to autonomous vehicles are localization, perception, and path planning. And of course, navigation still plays a part, but perhaps further in the future, navigation will be less important than some of the other features. So what are these? So localization is the ability of the sensors to correlate its position with the data in the car to know its exact position. So when my GPS and my sensors inside the vehicle tell me I'm at a point on the road, am I actually at that point, or am I somewhere else? The perception, what happens to the sensor in the car, can it actually differentiate between the set of traffic lights I can see directly in front of me, which I must obey, or is my sensor viewing the next set of lights further down the road? And how do I correlate that back to my position on the ground? And then path planning. What is the path that my car is going to take, and where's my journey going to take me? We've all seen lots of uh, news reports over the last couple of years when autonomous driving has become more and more on the road. And we can see some of the examples where the sensor reacts very, very quickly because it can't precede what's going to happen around the next bend, over the next crest of the hill, uh, etc. So there is a role to play for a map, for mapping data within autonomous vehicles. And as we can see today, the car knows exactly what's happening around it. There are so many sensors built into these cars now. Your average car on the road today has multiple sensors in it. The car of the future will have many, many more. And those sensors can see what's going on around it. How do I act and how do I react compared to other vehicles on the road? But also, what should I do based on what my sensor can see? So my sensor can see a traffic sign. My computer on board knows what that traffic sign means and can adapt accordingly. Um, I can perhaps see a bend coming up around the uh, right in the, the kind of horizon of my vision. So again, I can start to adapt, uh, accelerate, deaccelerate, change gear, etc., ready for that bend. But what about what I can't see around the corner? And that's where the mapping element within autonomous vehicles adds that extra layer. But it's not only the mapping, it's what sits on top of that. So imagine things like traffic. There is going to be traffic around the next bend, and historical information can tell us that at that time of the day, there is an average queue of five vehicles. Those five vehicles represent 20, 20 meters, 30 meters of traffic queue. So again, what I don't want is my autonomous vehicle to round a bend, not expecting a traffic queue, when we know that there is going to be a traffic queue around that bend. And again, the car can start to adapt itself accordingly 
uh, and make a much safer, more comfortable experience for the driver. So what are the components? Um, so we have HD map, and our HD map is designed to give centimeter accuracy uh, on the road, and it's capturing all that information. So what are the lanes on the road? What are the lane markings? What are the width of those lanes? What are at the edges of the road? What are the barriers, et cetera? Are there speed signs? Are there traffic lights? Are there poles? Are there bridges? Are there trees? And so it goes on and on and on. Imagine everything you can see when you drive down a road is captured. Then there's the localization part. How can the sensors in the vehicle recognize what is its surroundings? What happens if I look at a tree in the summer versus looking at a tree in the winter? Can my sensors still correlate that it's exactly the same feature? All these things are put into the base of the map to make sure that the sensors in the car can recognize its surroundings exactly like a human brain would. And on top of that sits live services. So live services could be anything from traffic. It's how much traffic is on the road. Should the car actually take such a road in an autonomous mode uh, where it perhaps can't uh, interact with other cars as well as it can do maybe in five or 10 years down the line. What about weather? How does weather play an impact on my autonomous driving? We're even now starting to see autonomous routes. So take me on a route to my destination, which gives me the most hands-off time the wheel. It doesn't matter that it takes me 15 minutes longer, 10 minutes longer. It means that I can have hands-off for a much longer time than going on a more direct journey, which means potentially in the future, I can look at my email, I can prepare for my meeting, I can join my conference call. But where are we today? Uh, I think it's well known there are different levels uh, of autonomous driving. And as we move from ADAS through to AD, we can say where the changes happen. So we go from most basic systems today in most cars, which are completely non-autonomous. The driver has 100% control. We then move into some automated subsystems, so level one. And then we start to look at some automation like cruise control, maybe uh, braking based on speed and based on other cars around me. Level two, so the third one along, level two in the system um, starts to bring in more advanced features. Um, this is where the vehicle knows some of the things that are on the road that are going to impact the journey. So it could be some basic features that we start to see in maybe more commercial vehicles. So ADAS features such as incline, curvature of road. So if my truck is approaching a hill, know that I can reduce my speed accordingly, but come down into the gears uh, and be more economical all the way through. Or if I'm approaching a bend, I need to make sure if I'm in a big vehicle, I need to slow down more. If I'm approaching in a car, slow down at the right point so that the occupants of the car aren't being thrown around inside when I hit the bend too fast because my sensors just recognize that I'm coming up to a bend. Level three, so now we're hands off conditionally. Uh, and this is where we start to see vehicles now on the road. And we've all seen the stories uh, that have been abound, uh, the Uber stories, the Tesla stories, uh, et cetera, where hands off the wheel. I mean, I read an article in the British press uh, earlier this week where somebody had been uh, banned and I think jailed for six or 18 months uh, for actually getting into the passenger seat and driving down a motorway in his Tesla. We're not there yet. We're a long, long way away from that. Um, but you are able to take the hands off the wheel and the car will adapt its speed. It can even change lanes because it knows exactly where it is, knows what lane does what. So when I'm looking to exit a highway, knows which lane I need to be in and can start to uh, adapt ahead of time. Number four, uh, next to last one, I, I've pretty much got my hands off the wheel completely now, and the car is doing majority of the work, but I'm still able to step in, take control, uh, and take over when I need to. I guess that's more like autopilot on a plane. You, know, you get onto the plane, the pilot takes off, pretty much goes into autopilot for a majority of the route until you come into land, and often coming into land is on autopilot as well. Um, but at any point in that, in that journey, I can take control and I can go back into manual mode. Until we get to the last one, and the last one being level five, 
and that's a completely autonomous vehicle where you don't even have a steering wheel, you don't have a driver, uh, and the, the vehicle is completely autonomized. Will we see this in our lifetimes? I think so, but very, very limited. I don't think we're going to see the science fiction that we all knew about from the 70s and 80s where cars are going to drive, we're all going to sit around a little table in the middle enjoying our, our Sunday dinner or our meetings. Uh, I think it will be in very limited numbers and it will be on limited access roads, it will be on highways. Uh, but it will come. The area in the middle is the area that's being fought for at the moment and I think between now and say 2022 is when you're going to see the biggest change uh, in how these vehicles interact. And on the bottom you can see how we move from ADAS systems, so with maps, with features that give anticipation of what's going on, through to fully automated systems where the data has to be much richer uh, and much more in depth. And in order to do that, we need to evolve. Um, so everything starts with the road network. The road is base on which everything is connected. From there, we start to add additional layers, additional features. So addressing for things like geocoding, especially important for businesses who are running fleets, etc. Traffic signs can add to navigation. So what do I need to do? Where do I need to go? Points of interest for search functionality. Again, I get into my car. I want to, my car to take me to a place. I want it to search. I want to be able to use my Alexas, my Siris, etc., to say, where is it I want to travel to? 3D and visualization, I think, is becoming more prominent. More and more vehicles today, their in-dash navigation systems are in 3D, especially when you get into cities. And it's there to give the user better perception of where they're traveling. How many people, when you think about using a paper map, still turn it upside down to look at the direction of travel? Trying to perceive what's on a map and what's on the ground is very, very difficult sometimes. Putting 3D in gives it a much more natural effect to what's around you. ADAS, as we've talked about, brings in driver assistance, so curvature uh, at junctions, et cetera, so my car can start to adapt. And then we start to bring in the more advanced features for automated driving, so HD uh, and road DNA. And all of this is because we all perceive things differently. This is how we know the world. We can see things and we can understand things, colors, shapes, messages, etc. That's not the same for a vehicle. That's how a navigation system understands the world. And it's all about a set of layers that can show how the roads connect, what direction to take, and when I need to make a decision uh, for the driver to change um, their, their habit or their, their use inside the vehicle. But that's how a machine sees a map. And this is a HD map uh, of the same road junction that we just saw there. Uh, but now we start to bring in many, many more features. So where is the center line on the road? Where are the boundaries of the road? How many lanes are there? Which lane does what? Which lane takes me to my destination? Which lane allows me to continue along the road? And all of these features support, support back to those original pillars. So that loca localization perception and planning. So how we see something versus how a machine sees something. And all of this is how the map is going to evolve in the future uh, inside the vehicles. It's got to be highly attributed. If it isn't, then the vehicle is going to do things that are incorrect, such as wrong speeds, wrong lanes. It's got to be highly accurate as well. It's no good having a system in a car that tells me I'm within 10 meters of my actual position, because 10 meters can be the difference between being on the wrong road or being in the wrong ditch. And it also needs to be highly maintained. If something happens on the road today and my vehicle doesn't know about it, how can it adapt? So the cycle of change between something happening on the ground and it being back inside the vehicle has to be instantaneous. Are we there yet? No. Are we getting there? Absolutely. But coverage is also an important thing. Today, TomTom Tom provides just under 400,000 kilometers of HD map and road DNA. 
compare that to how many kilometers of road there are in the world, and it's, it's points of a percent. So in Western Europe, every major highway is covered. In the US, every major highway and secondary roads in, in key areas. And in Japan, uh, every major highway. This is a starting point. This allows those cars to start to test their systems in the areas where autonomous cars are going to be, mainly restricted highways. But how does it all work? It's a big circle, and I know this isn't really a circle, but it's easier to describe than showing it uh, circular. So it starts up at the top with the TomTom Tom cloud, and from that cloud, the data starts to be created and evolved. And generally, it comes from professional sources. And those professional sources range, and they can be local authorities who are telling us about a road change, a highway closure. It can be vehicles themselves providing their information back in to say this is what's happening on the ground. All of that goes into a data gateway or a product store. From that, there are two flows. So the HD map production. The HD map is what resides inside the vehicle. That is the base of all the decision making uh, of the machine in terms of navigation, routing, etc. But you then have live map production. And live map production allows us to push any change that has happened on the ground relative to the map in that car straight into the vehicle. So that means when change is detected, it can be adapted and it can be pushed back to the vehicle. And that's done via this server here called AutoStream. And I'll show you towards the end of this presentation a small demonstration. We then cross, and we go from a TomTom -tom environment to an OEM environment. So this is now sitting in the ownership of the OEM cloud, be that uh, Nissan, BMW, Renault, uh, et cetera. There is still a standard map component here at the end. And the standard map component still allows for navigation, because at the moment, people still want to be able to put navigation and routing into their cars. In the future, you will just tell a car via voice command where you want to go, and the car will do the rest. But for now, and for the forthcoming years, there's still going to be an element of map display inside the vehicle. You've then got a client side uh, within the vehicle, within, within the system, which then feeds. And that will feed into the autonomous driving system um, and will be supported by vehicle sensors. And those two together, will then feed back in through the sensor-derived observations back into the data gateway to make those changes. And so the loop continues. So the vehicle becomes the, the tool, the community, uh, for making those changes. And here's a little example. So on the top there, you can see um, the picture on the left-hand side shows where a car or set of cars have pushed the hazard warning light inside the vehicle. And that hazard warning light is feeding a message back through the vehicle, back into our servers to say something is happening on this road that a number of cars have activated their hazard warning lights. So in the map inside the vehicle, you now get an alert warning to say there are dangerous conditions ahead. So if I'm taking this route, I need to adapt my speed. If my car's in autonomous mode, it will start to adapt automatically. If it's in human mode, the driver can start to adapt their speed. It could also be that I take a completely different route now because I know that there's an issue on this one section of road, but that issue is flagged by all of these cars activating one button. On the bottom one here is linked to weather. On this particular bridge, uh, there's a number of cars have activated their fog lights. So fog lights activated on the car. Enough fog lights being activated over a period of time tells us that there's an issue with fog. If it was just one car, the system would query it, but wouldn't take an action. It needs to be above a threshold before it pushes it automatically. But you can see in this instance, there was a number of cars flicking on their fog lights, either automatically or manually, that will then tell us that there's an issue with fog on this particular stretch of road. And again, the system comes back and says, there's fog ahead, adjust your speed, do something different. So to show you how that works inside the vehicle, um, there's a demonstration now uh, using our AutoStream system. So AutoStream is something that will sit inside the car uh, and allow you to push all of the information that is being created into the vehicle in real time. And as changes happen, 
it will push those changes into the vehicle as your journey progresses. So we start off. It's pretty grim and gray here today, so we're going to start in Las Vegas, where it's always sunny and it's always warm. And we're going to go to, well, we go to San Francisco, shall we? At the top there, or Los Angeles? San Francisco. No, Los Angeles. If you click on, on route, there we go. So we're now going to create a route between Las Vegas and Los Angeles. And I'm going to choose the map that I want to see. Now, these settings are probably something that you would already have set up uh, inside your vehicle. But we'll go through them each just to show you what kind of settings we, we anticipate. So do I want to see the lanes in 3D so I can get some, I can get more granularity? Yes, please. Do I want to see all the traffic signs so I can start to adapt my speed? Yes, we'll have that as well. Do I want to know the speed limits? Absolutely. Do I want to know the road DNA so I can have that localization and perception of where my vehicle is? And do I want to see live data, such as jam tail warnings, traffic, or even EV stations for that range anxiety we heard about earlier? And finally, do I want to see ADAS? So can I start to see in advance where the curves are, where the hills are? Yes, please. All of that is now calculated, uh, and we'll now select the map data needed to complete that journey. And as you can see, it starts to build up the system, builds a corridor approximately 10 kilometers wide of the road I'm going to take, and will then download into the vehicle. If the vehicle starts to change direction, if I decide I want to make a stop or go somewhere else, then the auto stream will automatically send the next, let, the next set of tiles uh, into the vehicle. If something happens in the map, maybe towards the end of my journey, coming into Los Angeles, maybe there's 200 vehicles have told us something has changed, then again, that information can be changed real time in the map server and pushed out to the vehicle. So by the time I arrive at my destination, all of those changes that all of that community has told has happened is now in the vehicle, and the vehicle can take, um, um, can take the benefit of it. So that's a small demonstration of AutoStream. Uh, it's a live product in pre-production phase with a number of customers right now. Um, and we are testing it further and further in different parts of the world to understand what elements can be fed into the vehicle. But there's many, many areas. And I, just before we finish, I just want to leave you with a few thoughts about where things need to change in order to take this industry even further forward. The sensors within the vehicles need to come down in price. Everything starts at a high price. doesn't matter what technology it is. Everything gets smaller, and everything gets cheaper over time. And I think more sensors, lower priced, lower sized sensors within vehicles will really push the industry forward. There also, there also needs to be multi-sensor fusion, so all those sensors can fuse together and send that information so they can start to learn from each other. So if one sensor tells me something is happening in one part of the car and something tells me something in another, in another part of the car, all that information can be fed into the right place. Driving policy is a big one, uh, and I think insurance companies are looking more and more at how insurance policies impact autonomous driving in the future. System security to make sure that these vehicles can't be hacked and there isn't malicious intent uh, to send these vehicles into accidents, uh, etc. cetera. Um, secure connectivity, so how do we push this information over the air? So again, it can't be hacked, it can't be disrupted, but it's constant. There's no point in having a high-tech, all singing, all dancing autonomous vehicle when you drive in an area where you've got no data connection, no cell signal, and suddenly your autonomous vehicle doesn't really know what to do. And ultimately, there are so many manufacturers and so many cars out there all working on this technology that there has to become some kind of standardization over the interface. Otherwise, the whole system will never progress forward. So there has to be a joined up thinking. And to finish off, I just want to show you an area where we are progressing using sensors in cars to help us collect this data to support, to support uh, autonomous vehicles in the future. As the race toward autonomous driving intensifies, TomTom Tom is developing innovative technologies to power autonomous driving. An example of that is high-definition maps, which are a crucial component in autonomous driving systems. HD maps enable path planning and localization 
and aid perception, working in conjunction with onboard sensors, making cars safer and more comfortable. Building and maintaining HD maps is a complex process that requires expertise and advanced mapping capabilities. Today, TomTom Tom is the global leader in HD map coverage, with more than 360,000 kilometers of HD maps across Europe and the United States. To achieve this, TomTom Tom has relied on its fleet of mobile mapping vehicles. To enhance our HD map making and map maintenance, we are extracting map data from observations made by onboard cameras. Through the acquisition of Autonomous, an autonomous driving startup with heritage dating back to the DARPA challenge, we significantly increased our expertise in computer vision and data extraction, which are key for creating map observations from camera images. Combining this know-how with our existing artificial intelligence expertise, we're extracting map data, such as road geometry, traffic signs, and landmarks from camera images. Once the map data is extracted, it is compressed into rotograms. A rotogram is a compressed snippet of road data that can be sent to the cloud and anchored to the TomTom HD map. By leveraging input from camera-equipped vehicles, this process will allow us to crowdsource and automate the maintenance of the TomTom HD map. This will enable scalable and efficient updates to the TomTom HD map. By exploring and testing innovative techniques to automate the production and maintenance of HD maps, TomTom Tom is taking a key step toward making autonomous driving a reality. So, thank you, uh, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.